Hi, this is Dr. Bob Dannenhofer, the Public Health Office from Douglas County, here with another of our Facebook Lives. It's December the 1st, and uh, we've been doing this now for nine months, so let's go to it. This is my chance for me to answer your questions. I'm going to take my mask down as I'm here in the office all by myself. All right, so typically what we do is start at the world level, move down to the local level, uh, but mostly here to answer your questions. We already have some questions from the Facebook Live uh, Facebook questions at douglaspublichealthnetwork.org. We'll answer those first and then get to your answers for those people who are watching live. Still a very active pandemic, 64 million cases, uh, 1.49 million deaths, so we'll hit 1.5 million deaths and 65 million cases um, by, the, by tomorrow. Still a very active pandemic in, in the U.S., India, Turkey, interestingly, Russia, Brazil, Italy, and Germany. Um, still really going up in the U.S., although the numbers in this last week we'll talk about in a bit are a little hard to know in the U.S. because of the holiday. Uh, but cases are still are really going up in Turkey, Russia, and Brazil, but going down in India, Italy, and Germany. And just to see the the size of the problem in the U.S., the number of cases in the U.S. is equal to all of the new cases in India, Turkey, Russia, Brazil, Italy, and Germany. So we still have a really active pandemic here um, and probably the most active of anywhere in the world. In the U.S., we're now at 14 million cases, 275,000 deaths, and we're adding deaths very rapidly. There are now 38 states today or yesterday with over a thousand cases. We have 177,000 cases today. Now, this, this week with a holiday, it was really hard to tell for a couple of reasons. One is there was a lot of pre-travel testing, so that increased the amount of testing, but decreased the amount of testing that was available for symptomatic people. So the number of symptomatic tests in the few days before the holiday went down. And then during the holiday, uh, there were a lot of places that weren't open doing symptomatic testing. So the whole the amount of testing has increased in the last week. It's different kind of testing. It was more asymptomatic and less symptomatic. So I don't know what that means with lower numbers. Um, but still really active in the U.S. When you look at this heat map, pretty much the whole U.S. is, is bright uh, there's only a few places in the country that are not having very many cases. And actually, it turns out that Oregon and, and Maine, these two areas we talked about, are two, still two of the lowest, um, lowest heat map areas. And in Douglas County, although we've had a lot of cases over the last few weeks, we're still overall relatively low in comparison to other areas. Uh, in Oregon... Uh, we had 1,233 cases today, a lot of deaths. These were deaths that were happened over the week and got reported today. 76,000 cases overall and 963 deaths. One of the things during this time where testing and new cases and deaths and whatever may be delayed because of the holiday, one of the things I follow most carefully is hospitalizations. The hospitals are, hospitalizations are, are reported with no more than one day delay. And... The hospitals are really good at reporting, so I can trust the hospitalization data. The hospitalization data for the country and the state really look pretty grim. You know, during the early part of the pandemic, we had three or hundred or so people in the hospital at the time. We're now at 500. And in the U.S., we actually have the highest number of hospitalizations ever. That is really worse. And hospitalizations are really a pretty good measure. You don't get into the hospital unless you're pretty sick. Hospitalizations are reported pretty accurately. So this uptick in hospitalizations in Oregon and in the country is really, really, really worrisome. Um, in Douglas County, we're at uh, 975 cases. We had 13 new ones today. We've overall had 19 deaths, but and, tw and we have 20 current hospitalizations. Many of the people in the hospital now are really quite sick, and we may see some more deaths. Um, in Douglas County, we're seeing really big outbreaks at Curry Manor. That seems to be kind of weaning, but now a big outbreak down at Forest Glen. Uh, down in Canyonville, so lots of cases there, and uh, so we really worry about that area here. We're continuing to see uh, lots of small workplace outbreaks. 
And almost all of these workplace outbreaks can be attributed to the break room or to the, the briefing before the beginning of the day or the people who are doing things either before or after work. You know, let's go out for a drink or let's go out for lunch. And this is where we're seeing it. So again, the biggest thing we're seeing here is encounters where people don't wear masks either because they're at lunch or they're on break and they're close together. Um, got a lot of other things that we can talk about today if we get to a get to a quiet time. So Lee asks, what utility is there to have an antibody test? Well, antibody tests are blood tests, and they look to see the antibodies that you have in your blood that could tell you if you'd had this disease in the past. Um, antibody tests have four excellent uses, and one of the things I wanted to talk today was they look at blood donors. And so when they have blood donors, they obviously have lots of blood, and they can check for antibodies. And they check to find the earliest they found antibodies. And actually, they found some antibodies from blood donors back in December. So this was maybe here already in December of last year. And again, that wouldn't be surprising, because really until January, people didn't recognize what was going on, and there was still a lot of travel between the U.S. and China. So actually, for me, it would have been shocking had there not been uh, some, uh, some transmittal at that time. So an antibody test is very useful to find out disease patterns. The other thing we use it for is to see what percent of cases we're actually finding. And the other thing that came out this week was that if you look at the number of people who have antibodies and the number of people who have tested positive, the number of people with antibodies is greater, suggesting that we're only picking up a fraction of the number of cases that actually occur. Well, that's not surprising because we think that many people are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic or for whatever reason choose not to have a test. So again, not shocking to me that it's there. An antibody test is also useful if you think you had the disease in December, January, February, but weren't able to get a test. And so an antibody test might be able to show if you had it. And the last reason antibody tests may be useful is convalescent plasma. So convalescent plasma is plasma where people have had the disease, infused in people who are sick with the disease. Convalescent plasma has been really a bomb. So convalescent plasma was thought to be, this is going to be great. People have described it like the golden liquid, golden miracles. We spent a lot of money on doing it. I think what we've shown is that it really is quite safe, but sadly, not very effective. So although it's approved with an emergency use authorization, it's proven not to be very effective at all. So, you know, we've used our baseball analogy here. I think it's a, I think it's a ground out. I mean, a lot of work and you don't get much for it. So on CN, uh, somebody says, on CNN this morning, I see that in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, they have emergency use authorization for specialized use of the antibody therapy for COVID. Turns out everybody has it. It's a national emergency use authorization. They have set up a system in which if a person is identified as testing COVID positive and is high risk, they're notified by phone and offered IV antibody treatment, presuming the individual is infected within the first three or four days of the disease progress. So yes, there are several states in the Midwest that are doing that. So South Dakota is doing it, Nebraska is doing it. I heard maybe Oklahoma is gonna start doing it. And again, this is giving this antibody treatment to people early in the disease. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So um, this antibody treatment should work, right? Because it's monoclonal antibodies against this that seems to work. However, when they've tried it in the studies, it, it, is, it is remarkably not effective. So in high-risk people, it had no change in death rate. It had no change in severe disease rate. It did have a decrease in the number of people who visited the ED, which is a good thing, but not that great. And uh, it doesn't have anywhere near the miracle power ascribed to it by... Uh, Trump and Chris Christie. So Trump and Chris Christie's, you know, this is magic, um, but we haven't seen it in any of the studies. Now, one of the troubles is there was a lot going on for the president. It wasn't simply, uh, it wasn't simply this monoclonal antibody, monoclonal antibody, he got Pepsi, he got remdesivir, he got oxygen, he got fluids, and so he got lots of things along the way. And so it's really, really hard to know without doing the studies 
about what it is. Again, the studies are pretty unimpressive. Um, you know, you think if this was magic, you'd see a big decline in the death rate or a big decline in the intubation rate. It decreased the ED visit rate, so that's a good thing, but really not, not, not that impressive. Now, South Dakota and Nebraska are doing this part of a study to see how it works. I think that's very, very reasonable to, to do. Oregon has not done that yet. But if you look at the way South Dakota and Nebraska has handled this whole thing, it's terrible. I mean, South Dakota has many, 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 many times as many cases as, as Oregon, a far higher death rate. So I'm not sure that I would really follow South Dakota for anything dealing with COVID. I think they have truly messed it up. And so that they're doing this now, I, I don't know what to make of it. It seems like the house is on fire and you're putting a little salve on some of the people who get it there. I, I was really very disappointed in the response in the Midwest. And again, if people want to use a monoclonal antibody, it's okay. But I don't think it's the magic that um, the president said it would be. Now, part of it is that he got it very early on. So there were just some early studies of this. He got it under a thing called compassionate use. Really, you need to do better and bigger and better studies to see how it works. And we don't, we don't have those yet. But, but the idea that it's a home run, oh my God, it's great, it's going to cure everything, really doesn't seem to be, it really doesn't seem to be that, that effective. Um, so the person here says, I think that uh, antibody treatment has been a triple home run. Uh, not at all. So, again, you can't tell for those three individuals because the only thing they got was a monoclonal antibody. Maybe that's the case, but they all got many other things. And so I really, really don't think that's the case. Now, it is possible. It really is possible that I do more studies. They'll show it, but we haven't seen that in the past. So typically when studies come out, uh, you know, you get this initial result on these controlled studies, and they may get slightly better or slightly worse with time. But I don't think um, I don't think they said if it was iffy at best, we wouldn't be see the highest ranking politicians getting it with such dramatic positive outcomes. Again, uh, rich people get lots of things, and I'm not sure how they happen and whether it really makes a difference or not. And this is why when things come out and people say, "Hey, I got it, it's great," you really have to put this in perspective because maybe it was the Decadron. I think all of these people likely got Decadron. Decadron actually has shown to be, you know, as I, using my baseball analogy, a, a, a solid double. So that really does work. Remdesivir probably works a little bit. And so I don't know what you could make when somebody says, I got a drug and I got better especially when you got lots of different things and lots of things happen. So this is why you have to do science. Uh, so Bruce said, watching CBS Sunday morning was confusing about vaccines. Oh, yes. They said once a person gets it, they have to keep wearing a mask and social distancing until a large pop part of the population is added. That seems wrong. If you're protected, you're protected. The problem is that these vaccines, although very good, 90% effectiveness, are not 100%. So still, one out of 10 people who are who are uh, given the vaccine could still either get the vaccine, get the virus, or get the virus and pass it on to others. And so you probably are going to need to use a, a mask and social distancing until the disease is so rare in the community that your chance of getting it is low. So while the disease is very prevalent, let's say we had a thousand cases a day here in Douglas County, and the vaccine was 90% effective, that would still mean that you know, there's 100 cases of people who are unprotected. So I think we are still going to need to use masks and whatever until the disease is so uncommon in the community that we can get rid of these darn things. So um, Mary says, I walk with a friend several times a week. We walk six feet apart, no contact with each other. Um, I find that walking with a mask would be uncomfortable. And so we don't wear a mask when we walk. That's perfectly fine. If you're outdoors and you're six feet apart, you do not need to wear a mask. And um, so in the whole scheme of things, outdoor activities are 10 or 100 times less risky than indoor activities. So you're outdoor walking, which is good. Six feet apart reduces your risk even further. So I think your risk of being outside six feet apart is very low. 
And so I think that would be low. So we put out a little um, graphic a few weeks ago now. Um, wow. So a few weeks ago, it seems like even longer, uh, that looked at the low risk activities. And we went from the lowest risk activities like taking a walk outside by yourself, very low risk. Um, um, and then high risk activities like going to a bar with lots of people in it. This would be in the very low risk, very low risk. You're outside, you're six feet apart. Chance of getting in that situation is low. So Carla says, I've been developed deep fishes in my fingers from working in the school kitchen and all the hand washing. Yeah, I think that's indeed true. Um, can you develop cellulitis in your fingers from this? Um, maybe. What's the best remedy to make it go away? Sadly, the more we wash our hands, we wash off the natural barrier that's there. So the natural barrier on the hands is an intact skin surface covered by a little oil layer. And so when you wash, especially using a detergent soap, uh, what you can do is you wipe, off the, you wipe off the oil layer, and that now exposes the under layer to damage uh, from friction and other things. So the best thing that we suggest is to use a very mild soap. You do not need to use a strong soap when you wash your hands. The soap I like is Dove. It's very easy. And then to moisturize your hands as much as you can. Uh, have they said what age of children we be able to get the vaccine? I have not seen that yet. I th it was only tested in adults, so I think it's only going to be adults. I don't think it may be 16, but there's, it's not going to be young kids because it's not been tested yet in young kids. But again, we don't think young kids get very sick with it, nor do we think that young kids transmit it that much among themselves. And so I would think that kids would be last in the group to get this. And so I think it's going to be a while. So uh, do you feel it will be truly safe to get the vaccine? So the point is I haven't seen the data yet. Once I see the data, once the panels look at it, once the Oregon, Washington, California panel looks at it and they say it's safe, then I'll think it's safe. There is so much data that needs to be reviewed. I have tried to find the, the, the actual data. And so one of the things I do as kind of a nerd, is that when people talk about, oh, a study, most times people are looking at the news reports of the study. I always, if I can, find the study and actually read through the study, read through critiques of the study so that I get it. So on this vaccine, what you'll want to see is the actual trials. You know, this person got the disease, they were 27 years old and they wound up in the hospital or this and that. So you actually need to see the patient level detail to know about the safety. Everything I've seen so far suggests it's going to be very safe and very effective and I think I will get the vaccine. One of the things, um, one of the things about this is there's going to be a lot of local reactions. So on a scheme of, of reactions, you know, you have, the you have the vaccines that almost never give you troubles like hepatitis A or hepatitis B, and the ones that really sting and really hurt like the human papillomavirus and the Shingrix. This seems to be up with the Shingrix and the HPV. So there may be a fair number of people who have fever, muscle aches, headaches, really don't feel very good for a day or two after they get the shot. So we'll see. So Janet says, the people that are passing, are they being tested for COVID or just being called COVID deaths? This is so worrisome that nine months into this, people could still wonder if this is the case. All of the deaths were confirmed COVID cases. They all had disease, respiratory distress or whatever, related to their COVID. These are not people who are getting run over by buses. These are not people who are dying of old age. These are people who are dying miserable deaths in the hospital from COVID. So yes, they're all being tested for COVID and they're not just being called COVID deaths. Let us please get past that. There is absolutely no data to suggest that. I've had this crisp $50 bill ready to give to someone who can show me a single case, even one case in Oregon that, that would fit this description that they're just being called a COVID death and they get that $50 bill. I've been doing this since August. It's now no, December and nobody's taken me up on it, suggesting that it, if it existed, it must be incredibly rare. And I would suggest it doesn't exist at all. 
So has there been any con consideration given to spreading out the vaccine for first responders so that any side effects don't affect all our first responders at once? Yeah, that's clearly one of the big things we need to figure out. And that's why I want to actually look at the data. What percent of people, when they got the vaccine, were sick enough that they couldn't go to work for the next day or two? Think of how tragic it would be if the hospital said, okay, we're going we're gonna to immunize all 1,000 people, and the next day, 20% of them called in sick. <clears throat> they couldn't run the hospital with 20 people. 20% of the people calling in sick. Similarly, you know, let's say 10% of the people who get the vaccine get a fever. You're not supposed to go to work when you have a fever. And since it's going to be really hard to know, am I having fever because I have COVID, or am I having a fever because I got the COVID vaccine, it's going to make this really tricky. So I think we are planning when we do this um, to stagger these things so that everybody won't get at, at once. So if mercy, you know, if, the, if for example, you expected, if you expected, I don't know what the data is going to be, but if you expected 20% of the people to miss two days of work, you would need to figure out what, how many you could immunize so that you'd still have enough workforce to keep going. Um, so Mindy says, how many COVID patients can Mercy hold? How many more can we take? So about 20 people in the hospital today. Um, uh, 20 in the hospital today. So, I mean, we're not running out of, of beds at the hospital. The hospital could obviously take more, but unfortunately during COVID, there's not a moratorium on other diseases like stroke and heart attacks and cancer and whatever else. So the hospital has a number of people in it with cancer, heart attacks, and stroke. And so the hospital has had has never been totally full of needed to turn patients away. But it will get there if we have enough hospitalizations. So at 20, they're doing okay. If we had 40 hospitalizations, that would really, really be hard. At 60, it would have, it would mean a total different way for them doing business. And since gatherings are followed by cases, which are followed by hospitalizations, and then followed by deaths, we do worry with the big increase in cases we've had over the last three weeks, that we could start to see more hospitalizations. So Mercy's currently doing well. I was on the phone with them several times today. They're, they're doing okay, um, but we really, really need to bring down the caseload so they will not get overwhelmed because when they start to get busy, they're going to have to, they might close down elective surgeries like they've done up in Portland. And for many people, these elective surgeries are really needed. So I corresponding with a woman who needed a hysterectomy. Now, she doesn't need it this week or next week, but you know, with all the with all the, the bleeding and pain and whatever, she certainly wants to get it done as soon as possible. The other trouble is gonna be that if you wait, then come the springtime when you do open it up, there's gonna be all those people, new people who need surgeries, and it'll really mess up the system. So we really, really want to be sure to try and keep the number of hospitalizations low. In addition, these hospitalizations are miserable. I talked to someone who was hospitalized. It was just terrible. They said it was awful. It was lonely. Family wasn't around. They felt terrible. I mean, they, they just felt achy and feverish. They were given this high-flow oxygen. They weren't intubated, but they were given high-flow oxygen, which was really uncomfortable. Imagine uh, imagine somebody blowing um, uh like a hairdryer in your face for hours at a time. So we really want to avoid those antibodies, avoid those hospitalizations. The best place, best way to do that is to avoid the cases. The best way to do that is to avoid those gatherings. We've already seen a handful of problems from Thanksgiving gatherings. I mean, we're only five days after, so we're the earliest you'll see that. And I already know of two cases, one involving a, a policeman, one involving uh, a, a worker for us. And so this is really problematic. Um, Tim says, if restaurants have a tent for, out, for outside seating, are there rules for like that? How many, like how many sides the tent should have? No, we do not have official rules for that yet that I know of. Other places may be getting those. Um, you know, if you had a tent that was perfectly sealed, it would be like the same as being indoors. So the idea of being outside in a tent is that there's much more airflow. There's not anything particular about outside versus inside other than when you're typically outside in the fresh air, there's fresh air and there's stuff moving around. So I don't know. I'll look that up tonight to see. 
So uh, someone says, has blood that was donated before December 2019 been tested for antibodies? Yes. And so they've tested blood back as early as July 2018, and they don't find the antibodies until December of 2019. So Michelle says, I want to know about cases at the Cow Creek Casino. I asked this last week, but no answer. Please answer. So... Um, so there are cases down at uh, Seven Feathers. Uh, the cases at Seven Feathers seem to be all among employees. Uh, they seem to have come in, like many of these cases, through not through the casino, but through outside activities. People come to work. So all of our large employers, Mercy, the VA, the school districts, Seven Feathers, all of these places have had cases related to employees living their lives, coming to work, and then being found sick. So when we talk about workplace outbreaks, we're not saying it was spread in the workplace. What we're saying is there are people who are positive who work at a workplace. So that's all we know. We don't think there's been any spread to any uh, anybody else. So Tanya says, I received four blood bags of blood. Oh, my goodness, sorry to hear that. Last December and January, I could have antibodies. It's very unlikely. When you get blood, so... I gave blood yesterday. Uh, when you give blood, you give the blood and it's all whole blood. Uh, it is almost never given as whole blood. It is almost always separated into blood, which is likely what you got, that has no antibodies. All it has is red blood cells into platelets, which they give to people with bleeding problems. And then serum, which is the part that has the antibody or plasma or serum, which is what has the uh, antibodies in it. So on, if you got four bags of blood, you likely got packed red blood cells, which have very low antibodies levels, so you probably didn't. Um, yeah, so I know somebody who had it twice. Has the opinion changed on antibodies protecting people? Um, I don't think it's changed. I think we thought that antibodies would be good but not perfect. And again, I think that's what the Moderna study shows, is they're good but not perfect. I think the studies on reinfection shows that having infection the first time is good but not perfect. <clears throat> and having a disease is good but not perfect. Yeah, we have a couple of cases now of people who were infected early on and now are infected again. Some otherwise good studies. So we think that having the disease or having antibodies is good but not perfect, which goes back to the question from before about continuing to wear a mask. Good. Having had the disease, having had the vaccine will be good, but not perfect. What will be good is when we get the level of disease so low, where it is like where it is in Australia, where they have 10 cases a day or wherever, where there's only 10 cases a day in all of Australia, most people can go about without masks, without any other protection, because your chance of getting the disease is then very low. However, when there's 10 cases in a small town in Douglas County, that means that the disease is really prevalent, and you will need to use other measures. So how many doses of vaccine will a person need, Wendy asks? It varies by vaccine, but the three that are the leaders here, which are the Moderna vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, and the AstraZeneca vaccine, all need two doses. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine is said to only need one dose, but that one has been on hold now for about two months. So I don't think we're going to see that anytime soon. So Shelly says, uh, what do you think the distribution system for vaccines will look like? Um, so if you promise not to take me, not to hold me responsible for this because the, the information is, isn't out, I believe there are going to be three separate uh, avenues for vaccine. So let's take the early stage. So the early stage was really in the first six weeks. And that will be to immunize healthcare workers and residents of nursing homes. I think there's going to be a, a triple process. I think one of the processes is going to be that the vaccine will come from the feds to the state, from the state to the hospital, so that the hospital can immunize or vaccinate the people who work, um, the people who work um, at the hospital and whatever else. I think there's going to be another group of vaccines that's going to go from the feds to the state to public health. And working with our partners at Aviva, we'll use that to immunize healthcare personnel and EMS who are not associated with the hospital. They're about as many associated with the hospital as not. 
And then the third is going to go from the feds to two large pharmacy chains, CVS and Walgreens, who will then immunize nursing home workers and nursing home patients. Now, I only get this reading through the federal reports, but in terms of really knowing, I don't think we really know how this is going to go, but I think that's going to, how it's going to go. And I think it's going to go quickly over the next few weeks. So has anyone tested the efficacy of nanocolloidal silver nebulized to knock out COVID? Wendy asks. So you'll remember that back in uh, the summertime, there was a study from Michigan where they looked at one practice that used colloidal, uh, nebulized colloidal silver for their patients. And they had, a, as I remember, about 80 patients. They all got uh, nebulized silver, nebulized colloidal silver, and they've got other kinds of things along the way. And they had outcomes among their group, which, which looked pretty good. Now, of course, these were people who were incredibly healthy. They had a very low rate of obesity. They had a very real, low rate of smoking. They were generally quite a bit younger. So you would have thought they had done well. And at that time, what I said was, this is a report about nebulized silver, uh, uh, colloidal silver nebulized for this. And the, and the answer is, this was great. That was the first kind of observational study you should do. And now what you should do is a study, and you could easily do double blind study with colloidal silver, a double blind study that gives some colloidal silver and some not, and you look at the difference. I mean, it really is... It really is not that hard to do, and with the number of cases in the U.S., you could probably get it done in a week or two. I do not know that anybody has tested. I looked that up about two weeks ago, and I have not seen anything suggesting anybody's done the study, so I don't know. Uh, does it work or not? And the answer is, I don't know. There's some things you know, some things you don't. I don't know this. So if a group of people were exposed to someone whose spouse and child have covid do we need to worry? So let me see if I get this right. So there's, there's Bill who has a wife who's positive and a child is positive, but we don't know if Bill is positive. Do we need to worry? Yes, you need to worry because if the spouse and the child have it, the chance of Bill having it is pretty high. So you shouldn't be seeing Bill because Bill should be quarantined. Um, Bill should be quarantined. Now, a lot of this depends upon when the exposure dates were. We think that mo people are most contagious two days before and five days after the onset of symptoms. So if you were exposed to this person three weeks after the symptoms or before they had symptoms, maybe not. So it's, it's very, very fact-specific. Fact so, Crystal, if you want to call the call center tomorrow, we can get you the specifics about the dates of exposure in that. So generally, you don't have to worry about the contact of a contact. So, for example, um, if I go to work and... Um, if I go to work and I get exposed to somebody, I'm a contact, but then somebody who's exposed to, and I'm asymptomatic, somebody who's exposed to me, say, say at a different job, doesn't has a relatively low risk. Not zero, but a relatively low risk. So we think the risk of a contact, so if you're a close contact, 15 minutes for six, within six feet, you have about a 20% chance of getting the disease. Now, if you have more contact, like, you know, you sleep with this person, it's going to be higher than that. And if your contact is less than that, it's lower than that. If you're the contact of a contact, it's probably 1% or 2%, not 0 but 1% or 2%. And so there's no bright line here that, geez, at this point you're going to get it, and at this point you won't. The, the, the risk increases with time. Um, yeah. So uh, how are pre-existing di conditions determined? So pre-existing conditions is a very, very, very loose term, uh, meaning that it's any medical condition you have been diagnosed with. Well, if you use that, by the time you get to be your 60s, 85% of them have had something, right? You know, we've had uh, a kidney stone or we've had this or that. Whether these pre-existing conditions really change your risk, we don't know. 
the ASIP was meeting today, and they were going to talk about the pre-existing conditions and how to determine that. They had not published their results when I'd seen that, but that's clearly going to be an important thing. Uh, you know, which ones are high risk versus low risk. I think, for example, kidney stones are going to be low risk, but I think something like obesity is going to be high risk. And so we're going to need to understand which are the high and low risk conditions. And that's one of the things that they're going to do. Um, so Marianne says, are there any health conditions that would prevent a person from getting a vaccine? I don't know. That's, again, one of the things that we need to find on the labeling of these vaccines. Because the labeling of these vaccines is very specific. You know, on some of the vaccines, if you have an allergy to something, you can't get the vaccine. You know, if you previously had Guillain-Barre, you can't get the vaccine. This one, we do not know what they're going to be. I don't know of any now, but that's why I'll wait until they come out. Okay, well, a couple of things. Somebody the last time asked about quarantine camps. So the U.S. did have some quarantine camps in the early part of the pandemic to house people who either left um, cruise ships where there was infections and they needed to go somewhere and to sit out there quarantine without infecting others. So the U.S. had a dozen or so uh, quarantine camps in the U.S. early on. There's no active quarantine camps here. There was, a, you know, Canada, uh, New Zealand and Australia had been very strict. So if you go to New Zealand or Australia, you need to quarantine for two weeks, and they really watch you. You know, they don't say, well, please quarantine. You know, we'll come back to you at the end of two weeks. They put you in a, what's called a camp or a hotel, where you really need to stay, and they monitor, and they really don't let you out. There's a story of somebody in one of these Australian quarantine facilities who snuck out, and they, they got a huge fine, like a $30,000 fine or something for sneaking out of their quarantine camp. So we don't have these in the U.S. Uh, they do have these in other areas. I think given our pension for libertarianism, I think this is going to be pretty unlikely. So a friend had a rapid test because she had had a cough and headache. Good for her. So cough and headache, two of the really common symptoms that you see with this. I've been doing a bunch of case investigations over the last week. And what's striking is no two people I've talked to have had the same symptoms. Some have a lot of fever, some have none. Some have a lot of cough, some have very little cough. Uh, the only thing that is really predictive is loss of sense of smell or taste. I've not talked to anybody who doesn't have the disease who has that, and many of the people with the disease do. Diarrhea, some have it, some don't. Abdominal pain, some have it, some don't. Nausea, some have it, some don't. S sore throat, some have some have sore throat as their predominant symptoms. Most have none at all. Headache, a lot of people have, but headaches are very common. So she had cough and a headache. So she was great. So she got the test. The test was negative. Is she safe? Uh, likely. So we think that the um, rapid tests during the time you're symptomatic are 80 or 90% uh, sensitive. So probably 80 or 90% you can say she's safe. To really be truly safe to go back to work, say, she should wait until her symptoms are gone plus one day. So she should wait until her cough and headache are gone, one more day, go back to work. We then think that brings the safety level up to over 98%. So having a negative test now is a good thing, but not that predictive. To get really up to the 98%, you need to wait uh, uh, until your symptoms are gone plus a day. Uh, if you want to be 100% safe, you have to wait 14 days. Um, a lot of people are not going to wait 14 days, but she could wait that long. Okay, um, so um, uh, looked at a couple of other things. There's a mink outbreak in Oregon. So mink, uh, I didn't realize Oregon raised mink, but there's a mink farm in Oregon that was closed or quarantined because the mink got sick. Now people think, why mink? I mean, what's the story on that? Well, we've known for a long time that there are different... Um, animals that resemble humans in different ways. And we study them because they're like, and it's for different things, that, for different diseases and different conditions, it's different things. So for example, with heart disease, it's usually pigs. And because pig hearts and human hearts are actually remarkably alike. And so sometimes people will get what's called a porcine valve, it means it's from a pig in your heart because the, the human circulatory system and the pig circulatory system are relatively similar.
that's kind of odd why you would pick pigs, uh, for many things involving intelligence and whatever we use, monkeys or apes, because monkeys and apes are similar in some ways. For uh, blood things, we use monkeys, especially rhesus monkeys. So the RH factor is from rhesus monkeys. Um, so it's a, it's monkeys. Now, interestingly, for viral respiratory infections, we typically use uh, ferrets. So for years, when we look at respiratory disease, we use ferrets. Uh, I'm not sure why, but ferrets seem to be the best model for humans. Ferrets and mink are very closely related so that, so that this respiratory virus that we know affects humans and we know affects ferrets, we shouldn't be surprised that it affects mink also. Why that is, we don't really know. So Andre says, can you explain the difference between specificity and accuracy? So specificity is a, is a, very, is a very specific term. That's not a pun, but it's a very specific term, which means that uh, if you have a positive result, what is the chance that that positive result is a true positive versus a false positive? So a test, which is 100% specific, if it says you have the disease, you've got the disease, a test that's 50% specific would mean that... Um, it would mean that 50% of the time you'd have a disease and 50% of the time it would be a false positive. So when we're screening a lot of people, we want to get a disease that has a very high specificity. Uh, the other term is sensitivity. That is, how good is the disease at picking up somebody who actually has the disease? You'd like a, disease, you'd like a test also to be 100% sensitive that everybody who's tested has the disease tests positive. Now, there are very few tests that are 100% sensitive. Accuracy is a more general term that, me, that takes into account the sensitivity, the specificity, the positive predictive value, and the negative predictive value. And mo the most accurate tests have high levels there. There's no one specific way to measure accuracy. It's a more general term. So the most accurate tests would be a test that would have 100% sensitivity, 100% sensitivity, would also then have 100% positive and negative predictive value, that would be, a, that would be a, the most accurate test. There's very, very, very few tests out there that, that perform that well. So tests that, have, tests that have a specificity of more than 99% are pretty good. The PCR does. The rapid antigen tests probably don't. Um, and a test that has a sensitivity of over 90% is, is, is pretty good. Um, but no test is 100%. All right, a few more things. Um, uh, so the ACIP met today, so the, uh, the Committee on Infection Practices met today, and they went ahead to decide who should get the vaccine. And again, it, it looks like it's first going to go to healthcare workers and to uh, people who live in nursing homes. That will be a good thing because we think those are, are the high-risk groups. Uh, the, the British have put together a plan. Their plan actually is to do um, nursing home residents and then, that, and then by ages and then by risk conditions. And then in the end, they talk about who they'll get to in the end. And so that was a, that was a nice graphic model of how they would do it. And I think we'll likely do it about the same in the U.S. Again, the delivery of this is going to be hard. So one of the vaccines requires shipment in super cold conditions, so shipment on dry ice, which is really hard to do. Uh, the Moderna vaccine requires cold, but not that cold. I think the Pfizer vaccine is still a while out. That one's going to have the least stringent uh, requirements, but I think, I think I think the AstraZeneca vaccine is going to have some issues. Um, uh, it's going to have some issues. One of the issues is that it's a chimpanzee virus. So chimpanzee adenovirus, I think, sometimes some people have troubles with. The second is during the trial, they had a medication error for 3,000 patients. I think there's going to be a lot of questions about the, the, the care that they took and do in the study if they had 3,000 medication errors. And the third is sort of confusing data. So some of the people got a half dose followed by a by a full dose, got a good response. If they got a full dose followed by a full dose, they had a much less good response. That doesn't make any biologic sense. 
And so they're going to have, they have a bit of explaining to do before the AstraZeneca vaccine um, gets approved. Um, so what about a 92 year old? So it is great to get to 92. 92 year olds have a very high risk of dying should they get the disease. So 92 year olds, um, um, 92 year olds should get, should be one of the first group to get the vaccine. So the question is what's up with the negative numbers? Ugh. So the state has a, a system to process all of the data for, um, for COVID. Now, the system, the state's had the system for years to de deal with all of its diseases. And this disease has been, this system has been called Orpheus. And then the Orpheus system was pretty good at dealing with the volume of cases we had before, which was on a typical day, 60 or 80 disease cases a day. So there'd be a salmonella case here and a syphilis case here and a gonorrhea case there, but not a lot of cases uh, to deal with. And the system worked great with that. Well, now we get COVID where we have um, 2 million negative tests and the system is really getting overloaded. And so what's happening is the negative numbers, they're, po they're processing the positive numbers first, the positive cases you want to know about, negative numbers or the number of negative tests are building up. So the last I heard today at noon that there are 120,000 negative tests sitting in the system waiting to be processed because they're doing all the positives first. And this is a, this is a, a consequence of the system of the of the number of cases growing so fast that it's really just hard to follow them all and to process all the negative tests. We're told that by the end of the week that we should have some idea about what the resolution of those negative numbers are going to be. But right now, the negative numbers is is just totally confusing because, for example, we went a few days with no new negative tests. Well, we know there were tests done, but there were no new negative tests because of the um, of the system kind of choking on the volume of disease we've had. So what they did is they took Orpheus, they broke it off into a new system called Opera, and then a new system called Arius to deal with all of this. But even with that, uh, even with those changes, the system is very, very slow. And so our case investigators are spending a lot of time after hours adding into the system because during the day the system is, is painfully slow. So these people are working nights and weekends four o'clock in the morning are getting up to work when the system is faster. So it is a little, little, a uh, little frustrating. So the 92 year old, when will we know when it's his turn to get the vaccine? So again, we know generally that older people will be in the, in the second group. So the first group are going to be near it. I don't know where the 92 year old lives, but 92 year olds who live in nursing homes will be in the first group. 92 year olds who live in the, will be in the next group after that. But when we get to that next group, I don't know. I think in Douglas County, we likely have about five or 6,000 people who are in one of the healthcare worker or, uh, or, eat, or um, healthcare workers or nursing home resident groups, about 6,000 we have. And so 6,000, a lot of vaccines. I mean, we did a... We did a, a vaccine clinic this year, and we did great. We did 200. We have to do 30 of those to get to 6,000. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know what the, I don't know what the timeline is going to be, but I would think the 92 year old is going to be in that second or third group. They haven't decided the second or third group, but I think a 92 year old would likely be in the second or third group. Now. Most 92-year-olds are not getting, going out to a party and getting it themselves. The way the 92-year-old is getting sick is that somebody who is a 22-year-old goes to a party and then visits the 92-year-old and gives it to him that way. So in nursing homes, we do not think that the nursing home patients started this. We think what happened is people who work in a nursing home with a life on the outside got their disease at a church or a bar or a gathering or something else, came to work, maybe they didn't know they were sick, and spread it to others. And we were saying before that we had had no super spreader events in Douglas County until Halloween. Zero. We had none where one case led to more than three or four cases. We were incredibly lucky. But since, uh, since Halloween, we have had a slew of these. We've had two churches, two nursing homes, a party, 
So five events we think that are super spreader events um, that have really, really, really spread it around, and this is problematic. So when will teachers and child care workers fall in the vaccine group, Deborah asks, um, I don't know. Again, I, mean, I know the first group, and they're not in the first group. So child care workers and teachers, uh, I don't know. I imagine they'll be part of the next group, which are the essential workers, but we don't know if older people, people with underlying conditions, or essential workers, how that, how that will go. And again, that's, I need, we, that's what we're waiting for. So Evelyn says, can anyone force a healthcare worker to take the vaccine? Well, I, I think in this country, it's pretty hard to force people to do anything. And uh, in the beginning, I think there are going to be far more people who want a vaccine than there are vaccines. So I can't imagine that early on uh, we're going to force anybody to take vaccines. Now, let's imagine a time maybe a year from now where people have had, uh, there's enough vaccine out there. Everybody who's wanted one now has it. There's extra vaccine out there. I think by that time the disease will be under control, but let's say it's still not under control. Then there may be talk about mandatory vaccination. But, you know, my sense is that anytime you talk about mandatory anything, it raises the hackles of people. So you might get, you know, maybe in this country, had we had more voluntary mask use, we wouldn't have had such resistance to mandatory mask use. I don't know. So I'm not going to, far be it from me to force anybody to do anything. In my pediatric practice, I deal with a lot of people who are vaccine hesitant. And I never force them, people to do anything. We talk about it. We'll say, let's have this discussion. Let's have this discussion again. I'll answer all of your questions. I'll try to allay your fears. I will tell you that I would get vaccinated. I got my kids vaccinated. I would get my grandkids vaccinated. I totally believe in the power of vaccination. And sometimes they want to do it and sometimes not. Similarly with this, I, I'm gonna, I would talk to people about the side effects and the, and the benefits here. But I, I really don't see in our country that forcing people to take vaccines can work. Now, this may change. The VA has been very adamant about their workers getting flu vaccine. Some other countries have been very adamant about healthcare workers getting a vaccine. I just don't see it, though, in, in the U.S. for the civilian workforce. Okay, well, that's what we got for tonight. It's 6.52. It's time to call it a night. We'll do this again on Friday at 4 o'clock. Again, if you have questions, it really works great for the Facebook questions at douglaspublichealthnetwork.org because you get a chance to write down the questions and um, Vanessa or Christian or Kristen are not needing to type these in as fast as they can read them. So that would be, that would be great. Um, again, we have a number of challenges out there. The one challenge is really, truly, if anybody thinks that these deaths out there are somehow getting overcounted, that they're not really due to COVID, crisp $50 bill to anyone who can show me, um, uh, who can show me that, show me that there's a death that really isn't a COVID death in Oregon. The other crisp $50 bill is there's this internet meme, which I haven't seen in the last three weeks, that says, oh, I, I went to a testing event. I never even got tested, but then I got my result. They must be inflating the results. That meme has not circulated in the last three weeks. But again, crisp $50 bill to anybody who can show me that that's the case. Now, occasionally, cases get reported incorrectly. I mean, we are human beings doing this. So we had a case earlier this week where the age was misstated. We had a case earlier this week where uh, it was sent off to a lab back east, and they mixed up two. They mixed up some results, and they called some that were negative positive, and some that were positive negative, and they owned up to it. And they called all those people, and they told them that they'd made this mistake. And again, those are human errors, but this is no, no uh, sense of any cabal out there or any grand conspiracy theme to do that. So again, I have a hundred dollars waiting for people who can who can uh, show me that those two myths are really not just myths. Again, this is Dr. Bob Danahopper, Public Health Officer in Douglas County. Thank you. We'll do this again on Friday. Bye-bye.